God in the beauty of holiness on his holy Sabbath day. We understand the importance of the Sabbath, not only um, physically, but in a spiritual sense. It's a sense, a time when we are refreshed and we are going to have showers of blessings this morning as we expound on the word of God, as we study another lesson in the adult Sabbath school uh, review. This morning with me, Anik Adams, we have our regular uh, Sabbath um, panelists. And this morning we have Pastor Winston Joseph, Pastor Virgil Sams, Pastor Orville Joseph, and of course, Elder Bradley Knowles. We want to thank each of you gentlemen for being with us this morning. I pray you had a blessed week. I'm going to give you an opportunity at this time to greet the brethren before we get into our discussion. Hi, good morning, everybody. Pastor Joseph here. It's a pleasure being here with you this morning. I trust that we will enjoy our study and it will be a fruit in our lives. God bless you, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It is um, Orville Joseph here. Um, it's a nice. It's nice to be with you on this Sabbath morning to share with you the lesson. Um, I hope that as we go through this experience, that we all will be blessed. Good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be here this Sabbath morning to discuss the lesson. This lesson is a very fruitful one. I do, do believe that we all will be rich, blessed. As we study our lesson, light shines in the darkness. Good morning, everyone. I'm very, very excited to share with you that Jesus is still the light of the world. So if you walk in the darkness, you can reach out your hand and touch Jesus today. He can make the big difference in your life. Amen. Amen. I love that one, Elder, um, Elder Nose. Reach out and touch Jesus, even if it's the Him because his light will definitely radiate in and through you. Now, this morning, Whispering Hope family, we are studying or giving an overview of lesson number three entitled, Light Shines in the Darkness. I'm going to ask um, Elder Knowles to pray for us, to invite God's presence with us. And then I'm going to ask Pastor Sams just to look at the, um, the topic um, that we are studying for the week, which is Light Shines in the Darkness. And I'm going to ask you, Pastor Sams, just to give us a brief overview of what um, this particular topic um, speaks to and what we can expect for the discussion this week. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to give you thanks for all that you've done for us through the past days of the week. For granting us the opportunity to pause for a while and to delve into your words. I ask, oh God, that whatever may be discussed today may be a means of drawing all of us closer to you. That our lives, spiritually and physically, may be enlightened because we're trusting in you completely. You have said that you are the light of the world. And if we trust in you, we'll never be in darkness. I ask, oh God, today that you may strengthen us where we're weak, that you may grant us clarity of thought, that you may help us as a people to understand and recognize that you're still the only answer. Bless us today, pray Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. 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 Our lesson this week is entitled Light Shines in Darkness. Now, the Bible is full of um, that kind of imagery of how light dispels darkness. You know, um, you know, light has, has power to penetrate darkness. And our memory text from John chapter 12, verses, verse 35 says, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in this doesn't know where he is going. You know, now, which means that light always shines in the darkness, but we may not have the light always with us. And so we have to, we have to treasure the light. We have to walk in the light. And the light here refers to the light of God's word. A Psalm, a, a Psalm 119 verse 105 says, can you, uh, and, and of course we can all recite that, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now God's word is light, which, uh, 
uh, which um, with this light, we can face any darkness, any dark moment in our lives. And we, so therefore we must embrace God's word. And as we see as a track in the, in the Christian church that the beginning of the Christian church was, the, was it was very strong. It was like the, the white horse in Revelation. And the Christian church began with pure teachings of the word of God. And, and, and then we see the, from the first century, the Christian church beginning to grow, uh, began to grow. But then as we, as we continue, we see how Satan infiltrated God's church and how he caused God's church to compromise. And I do believe that as we explore this lesson uh, today, that God will open our minds, God will open our hearts and reveal much to us so that we can all benefit from this lesson, so that we can be fully equipped uh, to face the enemy in this great controversy. Amen, amen. So, Pastor Sam Devote line that again, we are in a great battle, this great controversy, and there are many facets to this battle. And we're going to continue to discuss um, today some of the, the strategies that the enemy has been using and is using in order to thwart God's plan and his purpose for us and also to um, lead us away from truth. And so before we continue, I'm going to just ask um, Pastor Orville. Pastor Orville, could you read our memory text for this week? Um, the one that is going to guide the discussion and the lesson and just um, highlight some key points that you'd want us to be aware of. Okay, our memory text today comes from John 12, 35, um, the New King James Version. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest a darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Okay. Um, again, uh, Jesus is echoing a, a call for believers and others to recognize that the time in which they live, that light is still available um, and accessible, and that it is important for us to walk in the light and be mindful of the light because um, darkness is creeping in. The enemy is, is, is expanding his kingdom, and um, it, it is possible that uh, darkness will overwhelm the light that is now available to you. So it, it is incumbent upon us to keep focus on ensuring that we walk in the light because whenever um, darkness overtakes light, uh, then people have lack direction, lack focus, lack a, a sense of understanding of where they are. And so it is important for us to ensure that we are always walking in the light. Uh, and that, I think, is the essence of our, um, our memory text this morning. Walking in the light. And as you would have said, the only way to... Um, avoid walking in darkness is to stay in the path of the light. And so we're going to go into an entire discussion this morning as to how we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians can do that despite um, the different roadblocks that are in our way. Now, historically, the church has always been a target for persecution. In the years following Christ's death and his resurrection, many were tortured thrown to the lions and burned at the stakes by imperial Rome for refusing to worship the deities. Thus worship and whom one chooses to worship has always been a polemical issue. Men like Zachariah, Uriah, John the Baptist, Stephen, Peter, all suffered for the cause of Christ and held on to their faith. And we, we are not exempt from such, um, such levels of persecution. Now, in Matthew 5, 10, the Bible says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the arch enemy, Satan, had to choose this strategy of persecution um, to attack God's people, to attack and to undermine his word. And so this morning, we will attempt to discuss several strategies employed by Satan to undermine the faith of Christ followers. And we're going to begin with the first one. And I'm going to ask my question here to Pastor Winston Joseph. Pastor Winston, the first strategy we want to look at is that of compromise. How is the character of Satan as revealed in scriptures? Um, how does he, how can we use his 
the, his revelation of the revelation of his character um to make some sort of link between um his, the use the way he uses the strategy of compromise to undermine and contradict God's authority. So what is the link between um, Satan's character and how does he use his character to undermine and contradict God's authority and his word? All right, as we look at um, uh, compromise, we recognize that um, what the devil does, he seeks to make to ensure that um, he brings us as close as possible to the to truth and mix it with error. Um, he, he, he wants fear to be in people's heart also so that they will choose um, what is not so fearful for them or way of life. All of us, we, we love life. And because we love life, there are certain things that happen before us. And when things begin to happen, we take the easy way out. In other words, we compromise. I'm saying to us that here it is that the devil uses this strategy because he feels it's effective for us. Now, mark you, what he started with, he started, first of all, with persecution. And that happens, you, you just mentioned, the churches that, that were there before. And individuals would have been persecuted. They would have been torn asunder. They would have been swept. They would have been fed to lions. Those things bring fear in your mind. Nowadays, people might be losing a job. They might be losing um, a, a family. They might be losing these things. And so they decide, hey, look, I will... I will compromise in order to maintain my family, in order to maintain my job. I'm saying to us that these are the strategies that Satan used. This strategy, it's effective because it affects the individual personally. I want us to understand in John 8, 44, it says, you are of the father of the devil and the desires of your fathers you want to do. In other words, we need to understand that there are two individuals here, two places here. We either deal with Father God or we deal with the devil. And it says if he chooses the devil's side, if he chooses to try to compromise or to do the wrong things, hey, it, we are choosing to do of our Father's level. It says, it continues, it says, he was a murderer. So in other words, the devil don't care about you. He doesn't care about me. He will do anything for you to make up to change your mind and say you know what i don't think i need to follow god i'm going to just go softly in this thing god is not so is not so um cruel that he will he will do this and do that but like it or not i want all of us to know that our god is strict and when our god asks us to go to the left we are to be going to the left he will never force you he will give you a choice and we need to choose because that is what, when we, when we choose, we're showing that we decide for God, we love God. So I continue, he says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. He does not stand. So he causes all of us who, who follow him not to stand in the truth also. He says, because there is no truth in him, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. I want us to understand that the devil that was that wants us to compromise wants us to make it look like because many of us are compromising even as Christians we come to church on a regular basis but when it's time for us to stand out and stand up we do not stand up and stand out we compromise we look like Christians we seem like Christians but way down in our heart the things that we do the things that we say do not say that we are true Christians. The enemy wants us to just blur the line. And when we blur the line, that's when we seek to compromise in order for our own benefit or the benefit of others. Amen, amen. So the compromise is pretty multifaceted and it reveals itself or presents itself in modern times in different ways. But we have to shield ourselves from this. And this is going to lead me to my next question. I'm going to ask this question to Pastor Sams. Now, um, Pastor Sams, how can we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians now um, deflect and protect ourselves from these subtle yet vicious attacks by the enemy?
Pastor Sam. Sam needs to put on his mic. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, it is important indeed that as God's people, that we spend time, valuable time, studying the Word of God. You know, the Bible talks about the Ephesians, um, that they, they, they did not entertain the, uh, the, the false teachings, but now the, the, the third, the, the church of Pegamos now accepted the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Uh, for example, some of the Nicolaitans say that you can drink alcohol and, I, um, and it will not affect you. It will not affect your soul. But, but when I drink alcohol, I, make I cannot make correct decisions. Now, now it will affect not only my body, but it also will affect my soul. It will affect my relationship with God. And so we see these compromises coming into the, in, into the church. And, some, um, I, and even today, we, there are lots of compromises that are coming into the church. Now, some of us might not drink alcohol, but we might commit you know, adultery. I and mean, we might even worship idols. Uh, but there is, uh, and I think more, there is more subtle kind of deception that is creeping into the church. Now, what if I don't pray when I wake up, when I wake up, you know, we, we, we can say, well, I will pray later. What if I don't read my Bible uh, when, I, when I get up in the morning? You know, we can say, well, I can read a portion uh, later on and we can put it off. And then we, we, we can spend the, 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 the time, not, not, and when the time comes, we may put it off again. And, you know, we find that, that the devil is conditioning the minds of people to, feel that they can just, you know, delay or they can put off the study of God's word. And so it is important that we that we do not um, allow this kind of um, subtle deception to take over us. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, we were known for people of the word. And, and, and it is time for us to get back there so that we can safeguard ourselves from any of the deceptions of the bible and, and um, uh, pastor joseph did mention you know how subtle the, um, the devil works in the mind of christians and so therefore it is important that we do not allow ourselves to to compromise we do not allow uh, this type of deception to take precedence over us but we are only safe when we when we spend time diligently studying god's word and praying daily Amen. Amen. So we are all vulnerable or susceptible to deception. But you're saying, Pastor Sams, that if we keep ourselves connected to, to Christ by reading and studying his word, it will be a strong shield for us so that we, we don't fall into this trap. Because as Pastor uh, Winston would have mentioned, um, what the enemy does is bring us as close as possible to the truth and mixing a little bit of error in it. And if we are not keen um, if we don't have the um, discernment from the Holy Spirit that something is wrong here, even as, you know, we, we might not be able to identify that very small um, bit of error. But no matter how much truth you have, it could be an ounce or an inch of error. Once there's a mixing of truth and error, I am going to stand this morning to say that it is error. You can't mix right and wrong and it be right, right? Once there's some bit of error, it will be error. And so we move on. Thank you so much, Pastor Sams. We move on in the discussion um, now because we would have looked at the, the strategy of compromise. Now we want to look at the whole aspect of um, apostasy because apostasy is another um, method that the enemy is going to use to, um, to as if he tries to infiltrate the church, influence and deceive, especially the very elect and of course the entire church um, as a result. And so the lesson speaks about the whole as the whole concept of savage wolves. What comes to your mind, Elder Bradley knows, when you think about savage wolves? And I want you to tell me, in your <clears throat> opinion, what is apostasy? And how does how would apostasy manifest itself in the church? Okay, so we're looking at the first of all, savage wolves. Wolves. Mm -hmm. Now, if we view the church in the that particular context, then uh, we're gonna see the church being identified as lambs, and lambs are generally helpless. 
Okay, so and if 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 um if a wolf pass by, you may stand a little chance. But if it says if it says a savage wolf, that means you stand no chance whatsoever. The ultimate action is for total destruction. Um, but before I get to the the second part about apostasy and so on, there's something I want to highlight here, right? Pertaining to darkness and so on, which I think is essential, just to uh, piggyback on what um, Pastor Orbit was saying. See, where there, where there is darkness, there is no beauty, there is no sense of direction, there is no confidence, there is no vision, right? And so in um in John 10, chapter 10, I think, the Bible says that um the thief cometh to, but to uh, kill and to destroy, right? But I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So the thief makes no sacrifice whatsoever, right? And 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 the thief is not interested in your um upward mobility, mobility. Okay, so what is apostasy? Apostasy is, is when you um. Let, let me, I want to put the simplest possible the other person can understand when you compromise when you go against the standard principles of God, especially if I want to join, bring it a little closer to you. All right, let's see with our church, for example, you are a certain event, you were following the principles all along, and then somehow some kind of compromise come in and you decide to move and go somewhere else, right? You would have apostatized in, in, um, in that context. And, and so generally, the, the reason for apostasy is, is, for, is because of misunderstanding, Okay. And um, and this is what Satan sets out to do because he understands that the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And if he can throw in a little something here and there to cause you to, be, to begin to second guess, then, then you, you're going to find yourself after time be, being in a position where you begin to compromise, right? Because you've come to the point where, where you begin to trust in your own self. I'm trusting in me. Right, and what we and where is the Bible says that we should do a trust in the Lord with all, and do not lean unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So, in other words, what I'm saying, everything that we do, every aspect of our lives, must not only be influenced by God but be directed by him. And so we become totally dependent on God if you want to be successful as a Christian, if you want to stay on the path that God wants us to be. We have to depend on him because in our own strength, we, we are totally unable and incapable of accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. Amen. Amen. So apostasy, as you said, the church is like a lamb. And we know the enemy is being described as a savage wolf, not as a wolf. Um, the Bible also speaks to him as, um, uh, what it says, um, the devil is as a roaring lion. So we get these strong images of terror, of hostility, you know, against God's people and his church. And then we see him using the whole tactic of apostasy where he allows us to believe um, to rely on our own strength. But you're saying and affirming, Elder Bradley, that we cannot afford to trust in our own selves and our own thinking. As a matter of fact, um, Sister White speaks to that, where she says, you know, men are going to profess to have new light and call themselves reformers. Um, and they will be influential in um, breaking the flock apart. I'm going to ask Pastor Orville at this time. Thank you so much for your submission, Elder Knowles. Pastor Orville, can you read for us Acts 20? Verse 30, there is a biblical account um, here that we want to discuss um, where Paul would have warned the church of an imminent apostasy. We already spoke about what apostasy is and how it manifests itself. Read for us Acts 20, 30, um, Elder Knowles. And um, I want you to, I'm going to ask my question as soon as you're done. Okay, Acts 20 and verse 30 says, um, and from among your own selves, I'm, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, um, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Amen. 
So the word of God speaks about the fact that apostasy can arise inside of the church. I want you to comment on that, um, Pastor Orville. I wouldn't expect that persons from the apostasy is going to rise up. I guess we have been studying, we have been studying the great controversy and we realize that the war started in heaven, a perfect place. Would you be able to make a link between, you know, the whole aspect of the great controversy where the, the origin of it was in heaven, where the apostasy took place in heaven and make a link between what is happening here um, in Acts 20, 30, where we're being warned that the, um, the insurgency is going to start within the church. The apostasy is going to start within the church. The heresies, the false doctrines, the other practices, they're going to originate in the church. Could you speak to that, um, Pastor Orville, and share with us if you know of any situation where this has already happened in the church or seems to be imminent? <laughs> okay, great. great. Um, so uh, uh, clearly um, the Apostle Paul um, points out uh, that there will come a time where, well, it is very evident because he points out that it's already happening in his time, um, where individuals will take um, a page out of the devil's playbook and apply that um, with, within their own context to, to draw people away from, from the faith. Uh, uh, it is clear to us from our previous two studies um, for this quarter that the devil's um, strategy was to uh, initiate a campaign uh, of falsehood uh, uh, across the, the angels so that he is able to draw them away, undermine confidence, um, you know, create a, 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 a belief that God isn't who he says he is, uh, and create an image of God that would allow the angels to move away. Um, it is the same way that within the church, you're going to find voices coming up that create this same scenario that the church isn't who she says he, um, she is, that leaders in the church are of a certain caliber, quality, uh, uh, um, even identifying them um, as, as agents of Satan. But through their deception, it is to draw people away from their confidence in the church of God, uh, draw people away from their confidence in the word of God. And uh, and so we see this happening on, I mean, you, you just have to go on YouTube and people send them every time um, where you see individuals who are being critical of the church, um, condemning the church, um, condemning in leaders in the church, um, putting labels on them. The desire is not really a personal attack on these individuals, but it is a strategy that is designed to undermine the confidence of people in the word of God and in the church. So that when you hear the church speaks, you, 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 you listen always with a question mark. Um, when you hear leaders you, um, in the church speak, you, you, you wonder what is their motive. Um, you, you begin to second guess them. And as a result, you try to follow the person who seem always to be pointing out the falsehood, pointing out the error, pointing out the wrongdoings and so on. And, and, and that is Satan's strategy because the goal is not really to highlight where people are going astray, but the, the goal is to divide and, and, and scatter the flock. And that, that's, the, that's the whole strategy. And when that is accomplished, then um, Satan has a, has, a, has, a, has a party, I would say, rejoicing over the fact that they listen i'm able to dislodge and so um you know even um, it, what is common to us here there are some adventists who uh one sabbath they want to be here in the church another sabbath they want to be in some other church some other some other voice they want to hear some other voice and i'm saying that god is saying listen you need to be focused and recognize that truth only resides in god you cannot believe that the Seventh-day Adventist, and some people tell them, oh, I believe the Seventh-day Adventist is a true church, but it is not doing this, it's not doing that, so you need to follow me, right? You can't believe that something is the truth and, uh, and, and true and right and correct, but yet still you're moving away from it to form something. Uh, you know, it is, it, I mean, and that's this, the, 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 the fall, fallacy of Satan's, um, uh, of Satan's message. That is, Oh, okay. Yeah, God might be creator. Okay, yes, God might be um omnipotent, omniscient, and so on. But but you know, he, you know, he's not really doing this for his for your benefit. He's doing it for his own benefit and that kind of thing. It undermines.
his confidence in God. Uh, and, and that is what we need to be careful of. Uh, we, we come to a church and people are fluid, though they know the Bible, or they can expound on the Bible, or every minute they're quoting Ellen White and they're bringing attention to themselves. Uh, and, and they're questioning, you know, uh, Oh, I believe the church, but you know, uh, the question in the, 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 how we we explain the doctrine. Uh, they say, "Oh, you you have it right, but you, you're not telling the people this, or you have it right, but you you know you're watching it down and so on, giving the impression that they are the voice that people to, should listen to." And we ought to be careful of that. Paul warns us that there are going to be people with their own agenda who comes up, and when people have their own agenda. Um, then we ought to be careful, um, mindful and careful of them. Uh, it, it is always, I believe that this is God's church. I believe that God has ordained this church to accomplish his purpose. And I believe that this church will continue. It will not always be perfect, as Ellen White says, but it still remains God's church. And anything outside the church is apostasy. Anything outside of the church is apostasy. Wow, powerful submission, Pastor Orville. Powerful submission. I'm just here. I'm ruminating on some of the the concept, the the points that you made, and one that stood out for me is that some of us as SDA Christians, we accept that we have the SDA Church is God's true church. We have the the message um to tell to the world. Yet still, we are listening to dissenting voices, and you know, caught are using allowing doubt um to cause us to to move away from what we should know or we, we proclaim to know is truth. So we are, at the end of the day, we have to make up our minds, right? We have to make up our minds um, where we're going to stand and whom we're going to serve. Now I'm going to ask Pastor Sam. Pastor Sam, um, Pastor Orville would have spoken about the whole aspect of um, compromise. And um, he also would have dealt with how um, apostasy can begin right in the church, can rise up from out of the church. My next question um, is this. Um, because the scriptures reveal the, the plan of salvation and it also exposes Satan. All right. So I'm moving on here to how we can safeguard ourselves from, you know, this imminent apostasy of which um, Pastor Orville would have just spoken. Um, my question is this. Um, and it's very, very, very simple. I want for you to look at how Satan would have attempted now to destroy the influence of the Bible, God's holy word. And I want you to look at it and tell me, explain to us, what is Satan's real purpose here? It probably would have come out at some point, but I want you to highlight. Why would Satan attempt to continually destroy the influence of the Bible? Okay, so we want to look at, of course, the importance or the role of God's holy word in this whole controversy. Why is the Bible under attack? And what is Satan's purpose? Pastor Sam? You know, we have seen that throughout this, this great controversy, how Satan is attempting to, to destroy God's church. So that members can lose confidence in uh, in God's work, and 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 just permit me to highlight a little what Pastor Joseph just mentioned before I, I answer directly, uh, because when when the Apostle Paul gave this warning, you know it is not just warning against you know members, but but leaders, you know folks who we did not perceive that they would rise up against the church or they will come with false teachings. So you know even in thinking about this, you know I. I, I, we, it tells me how much as a leader I ought to guard myself with the word to, uh, uh, against these false teachings. Now, now, when we talk about safeguard by the word, it underscores the importance of the Bible as the infallible revelation of God and will ultimately be the protection against deceptions of Satan. Drawing insight, you know, from from, from John chapter 14 and verse 15 and 17, you know, also Acts 20 and, and verse 33, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul emphasizes the significance of the scripture in safeguarding believers from deception. Now, the Bible describes as presenting heaven's plan for humanity's, uh, for humanity's salvation, being inspired by God and, and its entirety. 
and profitable for doctrine and reproof and for correction and instruction in righteousness. And so therefore, the lesson highlights that the Bible not only reveals God's infinite love and the truth of the great controversy, but also exposes satanic this, um, delusions and the devil's deception. Because you know, throughout history, Satan has sought to undermine the authority and the influence of God's work. And furthermore, the lesson challenges the, the, the notion that the Bible is merely a human creation, emphasizing that it is the word of God and the ultimate standard for understanding the sacred truth. It critiques modern thinking and, and focuses too much on the human side of, of, of scripture, arguing that such perspective undermines its authority and inspiration. And then, then the lesson also urges believers to stand firm against any attempt to undermine the authority and the inspiration of the Bible, recognizing that, the, that it is the foundation of their hope for eternity and the ultimate safeguard against uh, deception. And here is it again, we have God's word as our protection against uh, deception. Amen. Amen. So again, the word is what contains um, the promises. It contains the the, the information that we need in order to stand firm because the word exposes Satan's purpose and it also exposes God's um, aim or goal in saving us. And if we don't have, um, you know, knowledge of either of them, we can fall into the trap of being easily uh, deceived. Now, Pastor Winston, thank you so much, Pastor Sams. Pastor Winston, I'm going to put you in a hot seat right now. I haven't forgotten you and I want you to bring it real, live and direct. Now, it is a reality um, in our church that persons are moving away from our of, from the Seventh-day Adventist faith. They're going to different um, churches. Um, some of them may uphold the Sabbath, but they don't fully um, believe or conform to all of the doctrines of our Seventh-day Adventist faith. We have spoken about apostasy, and I have a question I'm going to bring in here at this point from um, Elder Kem Tong. His question is, when the church apostatized, um, she turned away from God and his ways to serve idols and, em and embrace their practices. The question that we have here is turning away from the church the same as turning away from God? Elder Winston, um, Pastor Winston? <laughs> Uh, good question. Um, I I, I want to say definitely yes. You know why I want to say yes? Because if we study the church, if we understand that the church is doing the principles of God, because God would have left the church here for a purpose. I, I mean, it's not about following Pastor Joseph. It's not about fa um, following Pastor Virgil. It's not about following Bradley. It's following the doctrines of the church. Now, God would have established those doctrines. And we as men are supposed to be following the doctrines of the church. And what God does for us, he makes sure he cleans up the church and he presents his, his virgin to us, pure, live, and direct. These things ought to be able to see in, in as we look in the word, we're supposed to see these things. The reason why I say yes is because we need to understand that the church is representing God. It is not God. It's representing God. Many individuals, as you say nowadays, will leave the church. And some leave because of their own problems that they have with individuals in the church. You see, we have got to understand that when I come to church, when I begin to follow God, and God has pointed me to this area that I ought not to worry about the other individuals that's trying to get me out of the church. But what I ought to do is to follow God constantly. You see, we ought to understand because like it or not, um, when we were talking before, a thing that came to mind was that we talk about the wolf. We talk about the lion that comes to destroy and to mess and tear people up. What the lion or the wolf or whatever does, they get into the flock. When they get into the flock, what they do, they separate the weakling from the other part of the flock. God says if we stand together, we will become stronger. But when we separate the weakling, 
then here it is that all sorts of other things can happen and penetrate. I want us to understand when we decide to look in the word of God and the word, because you mentioned also that people will look at the church and say, this is the true church. This is God's church. Individuals may not be ready so far as God is concerned. And they are in the church developing, growing daily. I am following God. I'm not following man. This is God's church. It's not man's church. So we ought to really understand what we're doing when we leave the church and we are running here, there, and everywhere. We are looking for other things other than what God is calling us to look for. We ought to make sure that we study to show ourselves approved, not unto man, but unto God. He says, uh, he says that we ought to make sure that as we study, that we know who God is. Read the word, as Brother Sam said. Read the word. Study the word. When we study the word, we have a strong, a solid foundation to stand on. And we also can bring other individuals who are going away from God to where God wants them. That's every single one of our responsibility. Not just the pastors, not just the, the leaders, but even individuals in the church who know God. Bring the discussion to the table and let's discuss it. Let's look at the word and see what the word has to say about it. And when we do those things, we'll develop and ask God, God, is this the way that we should go? We talk about Ellen White. When they sat down together and these guys were looking at the word and they were seeing all sorts of things, then is when after, after they would come to a conclusion, they would go to the prophetess and say, hey, look, what's God saying about this thing? She couldn't understand what they were discussing. But God would have revealed to her, we can trust the word of God. We can trust the church as to bring the word of God. Um, Amen. If, if you'd allow me to interject as, as well. Um, yes. I, I think it's well said by Pastor Joseph. Um, let me just, from, from my little perspective, say that the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not just another denomination. I think sometimes we get caught up in the list of denomination and think that, okay, Seventh-day Adventist Church is just a, one, another denomination. It is not. It is the church of God. Um, it is God's remnant church. Um, I, I, and so moving away from what God's remnant church constitutes apostasy. Um, if you go back to God's church, Israel, anytime you moved away from Israel, you apostatize. I mean, it, 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 it's as clear as that. And, and, and what people are doing nowadays, that same Acts 20, 30, is that people are trying to give you the impression that there's a certain kind of universality to the remnant or uh, there's a kind of virtual church that constitutes all righteous people. It's not necessarily the same day. But that's a fault. That's a deception of the enemy. That's part of what we're struggling here with in terms of the study, that individuals create the perception that the church isn't who God says the church is. And therefore, if you attack the church, you're not really attacking you're really attacking a denomination and not the church of God. And we ought to be careful with that concept. Um, if, if, if you go against the church established by God and the church that's following the truth of, as it is in God, you are going against God. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Wow, wow, wow. Come on okay, now. Um... The comments are going to be hot this morning. <laughs> yes. But go ahead, Yes, I, I want to uh, put in my two cents here as well, right? Um, because I grew up in the church as well, right? Um, I'm 60 plus right now. No. What I want to say is that the church is a work in progress, right? Sometimes the church is its own worst enemy. And we have to be factual. Sometimes the church does not listen. These are facts that are there. And, and, and I want to draw something to attention because we're looking at Paul and his teachings and so on as well. Paul challenged the status quo. Paul did, right? Paul chose to go and to study and so on. He challenged the status quo. So the church can be seen from one one vantage point. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to throw cold water on what was just said. 
However, the church can be seen from a denominational perspective, as well as the church can be seen through the lens of the invisible church, those who are faithful to God, right? And so I, I, from my perspective, we I think we need to view the church in the context of the kingdom rather than um, draw the full attention to just a set group. I think we're going to um, end up in trouble if we go down that particular route, right? Sometimes people are on a spiritual journey. They are in search of things. It does not necessarily mean that because they may have walked away for a period of time means that something is uh, radically wrong with them. Right? We have to be real. We have to be real. This, this, this is the point I want us to get across. Not it, right? Because you're searching. And sometimes people are searching and they don't get what they want right away. Well, if the church, as we view it, is God's true church, and if people are led by the Spirit of God, they will come back. Sometimes we are the ones who get a fit over certain things, right? However, however, I'm not trying to undermine anything talking about the, the, the true church and all these things and so on. Because I think it goes beyond where we're looking at it. Because I can be a seven Adventist and be lost. So it's deeper, it's deeper than just a set of beliefs. It yes. has to do with individuals and their connection with God. Am I 100% connected to God in the space that I am in? Right? And when I talk about space that I'm in, I, I am I'm speaking specifically to us as seven Adventists. Because sometimes what happens, people get lured into a sense of feeling so secure in doctrines and all these things and forget Jesus. The, the, the weightier things are what is essential, right? And so, and so this is what I want to draw attention to. As an individual, where are you in the context of God's true church? Where are you in the context of the remnant? Why, why do I do what I do? Where, where, where am I? What am I? What am I actually doing? Where is my focus? Am I saying not I, but Christ be honored, loved, exalted? Not I, but Christ be seen, be known, be heard? Not I, but Christ in every look and action? Not I, but Christ in every thought and word? Then if, we, if, if we're not coming to that, if that, what we, if, if, if that is not our focus, then we're hopeless, regardless of whether we're part of the true church or not as a member. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that submission, Elder Knows. I think it was a powerful one. It's one that brought some balance to the discussion. Of course, our chat is heating up. I have a few comments. So, um... Pastor Orville, Pastor Sams, um, some of us are of the view um, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, yes, we are the true church. We have a, a peculiar message to proclaim in these last days. Um, however, we know that apostasy is imminent and it's going to arise from right within the church. Um, Kem Tong as well has another question. So why do, why do the pastors preach? Why? Um, that God has other believers in other denominations because we we tend to say yes we are the true church but God has other people in His other <clears throat> church. Question is why do pastors preach that God has other believers in other denominations? And Pastor well, Orville, that's for you too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, it is not what it is not just what the pastors preach, but it's what. Uh, uh, Jesus said in his word uh, that he said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring. You know, um, and so it is not the pastors that is that is that is saying that. We have, because what the, the responsibility of the pastor is to preach um, God's word. And, and, and I must highlight another point that was brought out earlier with regards to the church, as you had asked the question, you know, because there are lots of folks that are reasoning uh, as to um, that they don't need to be in the church in order to be saved or they don't have you know there's this type of reason that the people are, are, are coming up with now but i want to say that there is no nowhere in scripture 
where it says that a man or woman can be saved outside of God's church. And so therefore, we are safe. The, the church is likened unto an, the ark of safety. And when we are connected to the vine, with the, to Christ in his church, then we are safe. And, and, and as I mentioned again, that there is no passage in scripture that says that a man or woman can be saved outside of God's church. We must be connected to God's, uh, to the true vine. Now, um, yeah, yeah. So therefore, what the pastor preaches, um, the, what the pastor preach is what Jesus taught from his word. And that is the responsibility of the pastors, of the preachers, to preach God's truth as it is in God's word. All right, I want to jump in here before anybody else jumps in. I'm going to direct this question to Pastor Orville because um, the persons who are studying, they have set people who they want, they, they want to target. Um, so you're saying that we cannot be saved outside of God's church. But my question is this, is Jesus coming back to save the church or is he coming back to save us individually? Because if I realize as a believer that the church is apostatizing, okay, I am being influenced, I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm highlighting that because another um, con fact that the lesson brings out is that some of us are not led by the Holy Spirit. We come up with our own ideas, our own um, concepts, and we, 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 our actions ensue from that. But if I am being led by the Holy Spirit and I see the church apostatizing, why is it questionable for me to leave if I see the church going contrary to the will of God? Why should be, I be a part of that? Don't I have the right to make my calling and election sure in Jesus and not the church? Is God coming back to save the church or is he coming back to save individuals in the church? Anyone can answer, but Pastor Orville, I want you to shoot first. Okay. Um, so so, so we, we, we have um, engaged the text. Um, you know, um, we are preaching the whole idea that other sheep I have, that a lot of this fold, they also must I bring so that there can be one fold and one shepherd. Uh, and so in that expression, Jesus is simply saying that anybody who's got to be saved must be of the same fold of which he is the shepherd of that fold. Uh, and, and so that that, that is clear. I, I think the other concept that we have to um, uh, be able to embrace is the fact that um, it is a concept of the church. Uh, the church is um, God's called out people that he has called for a purpose. Um, and, 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 and God is calling people all the time um, into, his, into his church for a purpose. Um, and, and so that must, be, that must be, be recognized. The fact that the church is imperfect, and Ellen White makes this uh, point absolutely clear, the, the point the fact that the church is imperfect, that there are imperfect people in the church, that there are imperfect leaders in the church, doesn't mean that the church isn't God's church. As a matter of fact, Ellen White goes on to say that, that, that um, it, it is the only object of, uh, upon earth that God bestows his supreme regard. Uh, and so God views the church um, as, as a unit that 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 re, that 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 um that is a recipient of his great consideration and, and god is coming back for a church god is coming back for a church the church comprises the believers those who have accepted jesus christ as their personal lord and savior Yes, a part of that collective group is going to be the son of perdition that Jesus is unable to save. Uh, that doesn't mean that when Jesus comes to the church, that it, because you say you are part of the church, that you will be saved. And I think that a part also is part of the, the thing that we don't understand, that we think that because we say that we are part of the church, that automatically saves us. Right, but Jesus, it is clear from our biblical understanding that Jesus is coming back for a church, those who are prepared and saved and ready for him. That's who he's coming back from. So we cannot divorce the coming uh, 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 of Jesus Christ from the church and make it an individual matter. Individ yes, we are saved individually, but we are recognized collectively as well. Right, so that is something that we have to bear in mind. 
Um, the, the, the second point that I want to make is that you cannot, Jesus makes another illustration with regards to those of us who are saved. He says, we are part of the vine. We, can, we are part of the vine. If you are connected to the vine, then you draw source from Jesus Christ, who is the vine, who is the true vine. Okay, if you disconnect yourself from the vine and graft yourself into something else or someone else, you are no longer part of the vine that draws from the source who is Jesus Christ. And that is not, it, it is not possible that you can be in the river and on the bank at the same time. It is one of the challenging things that Je um, Jeremiah the prophet dealt with, where, where, where the children of Israel was continually trying to play God, both sides of the fence and, 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 and God's message to them was you can't play both sides of the fence. You've got to make up your mind whether you're for God or you are for the devil. And I think the, the struggle here is that um, do we recognize the church as God's agency? And do we see it has its purpose in fulfilling God's mission in our time? Uh, Adventist theology has always taught us that, um, it, 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 you know, the church of God will, it, it came out of Israel was God's church in the wilderness, but Jesus Christ came and again reinvigorated the church and broadened the scope of the church to embrace both Jews and Gentiles in terms of the call and fulfillment of the mission um, of, of the church of God. But we saw the church um, in its youthful stage um, morphed uh, um, so that, you know, leaders themselves be became, as our lesson taught us, um, the one who distort the message. But God preserved the church even in the dark ages so, so that the church will always be preserved, right? Uh, 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 and, and so that is what makes the church different from an organization or a denomination, uh, from a, sorry, not organization, but from a denomination in that the church of God will always be preserved as a unit that preaches the everlasting gospel and hold to the truth of God. When individuals, and this is the point that we, at the lesson is trying to bring up, when individuals determine that they are the church, then that is dangerous. And that's what the lesson is saying. When, when individuals draw others away to themselves, then that is dangerous. When we draw individuals to Jesus Christ, we draw them to the Church of Christ, uh, and that is something that we need to understand. We need to understand and and recognize. Amen, amen. So, Pastor Orville, you have been excellent in um you know um clarifying the issue, um because it is a very strong issue. It's something I've heard persons say. Okay, and I'm so I'm happy you were able to expound on it clearly and i pray that everyone who is on whispering hope this morning that is clearer for them it's clearer for me um i have one other question i'm not sure if anybody else has anything to add to what pastor yeah. August said i did an excellent job yeah um, can i add my two cents please yes yeah um you know well we cannot deny the fact that that satan is working assiduously to destroy god's church and we uh we this was also predicted in the bible how satan will try his best to to, to destroy God's church. But we are still thankful that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, also, the servant of the Lord says that in feeble, as Pastor Joseph mentioned, in feeble and defective as the church may be, needing reproof, counsel, is still the object upon earth upon which, upon which God has bestowed his supreme regard. So regardless of God's church, and of course, you know, it is, it is, it is the responsibility of our of leaders to safeguard the church from truth, uh, from, from error, whenever it shows itself. Uh, but, but, but regardless as to what happens in God's church, it's still, it is still the church of God. It is still the apple of God's eye. So there, if, if, if there are those who may be thinking, well, yes, the church is, is, is apostatizing. The church is... You know, we must bear in mind the prophecy, what Jesus said in, 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 in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Ultimately, the church will be triumphant. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that submission. Yes. There's another question. Yes, well, before, you go, before you go there, right? Mm -hmm. 
I think uh, sometimes we flirt with um with danger. Okay. Um, because the church is not an exclusive club. The church is a part of the kingdom. The church is the voice in the kingdom of God to call people to God. We can end up in trouble if we get too comfortable in our space. Believing that the church is the answer. The church is not the answer. The church will never be the answer. The answer, it has been brought out already. It is God. And the Bible is pretty clear. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Right? Even what the church may not be able to see. God knows who his people are. Right? The, the Advent message is essential. It is important. But of everything else, we must not forget about the kingdom. For the kingdom of God is universal. It's not limited. You see, what, what are we going to be in danger of? What are we going to be in danger of? They're about um, 20 plus million seven Adventists. We already can have a figure, uh, an understanding as to how much people in modern times would be going to heaven. If, if we go down that particular route, we're going to be in danger. Right? Some things ought to be left to God. The church has to fulfill its purpose. My pur or the church's purpose is to declare the word of God and allow God to do the rest. Whatever God wants to do, let God accomplish that in the lives of individuals. Right? And, and, and it is no coincidence that thief could have been saved on the cross. It's not a coincidence because that's what the love of God does. Right? There's some things which our eyes may not see, but God sees and God understands. Again, I'm not belittling the purpose of the church, but the church has to understand its context where we view in the kingdom of God itself. It has a mission. And again, I reiterate, the church is the voice in the kingdom to make that call to the kingdom of God, and it goes beyond denomination. That's just my perspective. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, you and I will talk after um, Elder Knowles, but it's a powerful point in my estimation. Um, so I'm happy that we have, again, this balance of um, views coming out here in this discussion. The other question I was going to ask Pastor Winston is this, and this question comes from um, Elder Kem. He wanted us to clarify something. His question was, any, a statement was made in the discussion Anything outside of the church is apostasy. He wanted us to clarify um, exactly what is meant by the church in this context. I mean, first of all, let me let, let's clarify exactly what was said because the, the, the question, first of all, that was asked by Brother Kim before was that based on certain things, is that going against the church, right? And against God. And there were certain specific things that was mentioned. And I want to, I want to go back to them first and foremost, right? Because it was said here, if a person turned away from God and um, serve idols and embrace their practices, those were the terms, those were the terms that things were answered on first and foremost. And we need to understand that also. But when we look at, when we look at the Bible, and I want to reiterate what was said by the pastors here, that the bottom line is, I'm not saying that, that God doesn't do his thing, because we are not God. We are not God, but God has set up a church on, on, on earth. God has set up a way that people should know and mark you that the word of God through this church and through us is supposed to go through the whole world. It means, therefore, that we as individuals have to be working and doing the same thing that God is calling us to do. I, I stand I stand firmly on, on the matter where, where, where we as a church need to make sure that we're doing the work that God has called us. I'm not going into the fact that well, of the things that I don't know. What I know right now is that God has called his people to a church. Not to stand out as individual, Matthew. I try to go, I try to go mango. I try to go lemon. I try to go all sorts of things in my yard. 
coconut. But wherever you find that the coconut fall off of the tree, there's no source that the coconut can hold on to. You understand where I'm coming from? And when you pull the mango off of the tree, the young mangoes that fall off the tree, they never get the flavor that the mangoes that stay on the tree and you pick it off of the tree have. You will never get the source. They never get the flavor. And so we need to understand where we, where, where, where God is calling us. God is an organized God. He's not a God for here, there, and everywhere. And, and you come into, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end is destruction. We need to understand that God has a particular way. He's not just throwing out his net out there and saying, whosoever will. He's saying to us, that these are my requirements. This is what I need you to do. God is organized. And so we need to understand that when we say God is organized, that we ought to be following. All right? Now we need to, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there, there, there's a part of the question that you're looking at there. Could you repeat the question one more time? I have to say that to get it off. Like everybody was saying, but I didn't get to say it. Okay, but he so just wanted to um. Anything outside of the church is apostasy, and he just wanted us to clarify mm -hmm. what is meant by the church in this context. No, we, we 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 look at we we know full well that the Seventh Day Adventist Church is a called out people. People were called out to be here. Now, mark you, then uh, uh, we we do know that he said them also that I will bring. Mark you, if you're not willing to come when God has called you, then can you say you belong to God's church? Even though you're going to church? We're looking at the physical here. And we should not only just look at the physical. And I want us to understand that because, uh, and I strongly stand with the fact, we're not just talking about a denomination. We're talking about the people who are called out and following what God says. And if God says that you are one, then you should not be standing aloof. And that's why I made mention of the mango tree. Because when I drop off the mango tree and I say, well, I don't need the mango tree anymore for sustenance, then could I be a part of God's church? No. I may be in Asia and, I'm, and somebody in Antigua. We are part of God's church. We are part of God's church. I may be in in, 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 in so, but are we following what God calls us to do? The seven Adventist church is specifically called out for God's people. I'm saying, He says, He will bring others, them also I will bring. If God chooses to save individuals where He, wherever they are, and they don't have a, they don't have, a, when I, I'm not talking about a, 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 a baptismal certificate from the seven Adventist church. And they didn't get baptized by the seven Adventist church. That doesn't mean that they're not saved. Because they didn't have the opportunity. But I'm saying when people are following God. Because when Jesus was here. And the disciples were here. And the individuals were there worshipping. And they were doing all sorts of things. Jesus told me leave them alone. Leave them alone. Let them continue. Let them do. Because God knows that when he says he directs people. He knows the heart. But God is coming for his church are prepared people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor Winston. The conversation, the discussion was really a deep one, really um, polemical. It was controversial. We had a lot of persons commenting in the chat this morning, but we are out of time. I, however, I'm going to blend two days lesson questions in one. The lesson would have brought out the fact that Satan is battling for our minds the mind, our mind, which is the seat of our thinking, where we're able to perceive, where we're able to understand the truth. And it says here that Satan's principal work is to blind or to darken men's minds. He does this by keeping them from the study of God's word, by deranging the powers of their mind through the excesses of body and soul, by allowing us to be so over overly preoccupied with the, um, the issues and challenges of life and by appealing to pride and self-exaltation. Now, if we know that, we have to guard our minds, okay? And one point that you brought up, Pastor Winston, is that in Proverbs 16, 25, I think, let me just go back up, the Bible says, yes, that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof um, are the ways of death. 
My question here is this, and it's based on um, a quotation the lesson brought out. Truth is not a matter of opinion. It is a matter of divine revelation. Comment on this quote, anyone. Comment on this quote found in the lesson as it relates to another of Satan's strategies um, to deceive. And this strategy is to lead us to believe that human reasoning, unaided by the Holy Spirit and uninformed by the word of God, is sufficient to understand divine things. Satan wants us to believe that we can just come up and think whatever we're thinking from our own human perspective. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't need God to guide us and to give us understanding. Truth is not a matter of opinion. It is a matter of divine revelation. My question is, how, I want you to comment on it and make a link between, uh, as it relates to the strategy that Satan is using to deceive us. Anyone? And then we wrap up the lesson. Truth is always truth. Um, uh, Jesus Christ is truth. I think the very first day um, we we learned that um, you know that Jesus Christ is truth. Uh, that we ought not to surrender truth for for anything else. Um, Jesus in his prayer um, says, "Sanctify them uh, through thy word. Thy word is truth." Okay, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Um, and that is something that we need to pay attention to and be focused on. Um, and he, he also said in, in John 8 and 32, um, they shall know the truth and the truth will, will, will set them will, will set them free. Um, it, so, that, so that as we embrace Jesus Christ, we are embracing truth. Um, one of the truth that we have discussed here this morning is the same is the truth that Jesus prayed for in um in, in that same prayer in John 17 that they all may be one as you and I are one you uh, 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 and the Holy Spirit are one um so that Jesus Christ prayed for unity um the, the, the division the this divisiveness the separation the, the, if I don't agree with you then I need to separate from you and and we can all exist together um no it, it, that that's not jesus what jesus expects or anticipates jesus expects that the truth would be that we all are able to work if we are in him we can work together if we are in him we are preaching the same gospel if we are in him we are calling the same people to the same place that is god's expectation and once we move away from that we are moving away from the truth that is in jesus christ Amen. Amen. So there's no um, ability. We don't have any capability to discover divine truth with, with our finite minds. Are you um, agreeing with that statement? I, 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 absolutely. Um, the Bible, the scripture is absolutely clear. That is why Jesus said that when he, he when he departs, that he's going to make the, the Holy Spirit available that will guide us into all truth. Now, um, one of the challenges that we have in these days is for everybody to get up and say, well, the Holy Spirit is guiding me. Well, the, the yardstick that determines whether or not the Holy Spirit is guiding you is whether or not you abide by the same truth that is in Jesus Christ. Okay? So if, 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 if the Holy Spirit is guiding you, certainly he is not moving you away from the truth. He is drawing you into the truth that is in Jesus Christ. And, and, and that becomes the, the, um, the, the, the defining one. One of the things that we, um, what we always use is, is um, I think it's Isaiah 8 um, and, and verse 32, if I'm not mistaken, where we talk about the identifying the true, the true prophet. Um, we, 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 if they speak not according to this word, it's because they have no light in them. Um, anybody that talks about division, separation, moving away, um, it, it is because right uh it is because they have no truth in them the, the, the truth draws people into unison into co cohesion with the word of god as it is revealed by the word of god and not to distinctiveness and uh, the effort and, uh, um, of god is always to unite us to bring us together for us to work together for us to be saved together and that, that's the effort of the gospel and and, and, and once we begin to talk about uh, you know being individualistic then um then we are not in the same frame of mind as jesus christ because jesus the frame of mind of jesus is one of unity 
and, and one that we follow the same truth. And, and, and as believers, that, that's what we need to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Orville. That is why you are senior pastor. You always um, have the courage and the, the, the know-how how to just hit those hard questions without fear. God bless you and thank you so much for submitting that. Elder Lowe's, I'm going to give you the final question today. And it has to do with a quotation from the SBA commentary as it relates to um, the role of the gospel. It says that the gospel is the only means by which Satan's diabolical schemes and deceptions can be exposed and by which men can see the way from darkness to light, the gospel. Now we know that Satan's kingdom um, is a kingdom of darkness. How does the gospel, or what is the gospel, and how does the gospel, um, what's the word, coincide with the, the kingdom of light that we need in order to be saved and to be equipped for this great battle? Okay, um, so the gospel, is the good news of the kingdom, right? The Bible says that the entrance of the word bring it light, right? So I want to tie these in together. So, so the, the, the God's kingdom is a kingdom of light versus Satan's kingdom, which is a kingdom of darkness. All right, I see like what I said initially that um, in darkness, there's no vision. You, 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 can't, you can't see anything. There is no beauty. There's no sense of purpose in darkness. What is in darkness, is all, it always leads to death. In light, light leads to life. And in the context of the kingdom of God, it leads to life eternal. Right? Hence, let me, let me reiterate again. The church has a purpose where the kingdom of God is concerned. To share light and to be light, right? Because many times we, we we fail in certain aspects because sometimes we think it's just sharing the light that is that is most important. But from my vantage point, being the light is just as important or even more important because the life that is lived for God is the most important example for the kingdom. Right. And, and so and so it behoves us as individuals to make sure at all times that whatever we do is directed by God himself, because we have a high and a holy purpose, a high and a holy calling to be in the forefront of the kingdom. We are the soldiers in the forefront and those with the forefront have their lives on the line. OK, and so so there is no there is no space in the forefront for compromise and these things. We have to make sure that we understand who we are as a people and to understand that the kingdom of God is all inclusive. All is an all inclusive kingdom that we're part of. And once that light is there, people would be able to see clearly what is going on because that's what the Bible said in Matthew chapter five, that they may see your good works and God get the glory. Again, let me reiterate again. It's not about drawing attention to us, to ourselves as a church, but to promote God so people can see who God is and what God is about, what his purpose is in our life. Right? And so and so long as we can understand that, then the church can never, ever fail in any aspect of its growth or its upward mobility. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Elder Nose. This morning we were discussing light shines in the darkness. And the lesson just highlighted that Jesus Christ himself um, testifies, the scripture testifies of Jesus. And Jesus, of course, is the heart of the gospel. And once we accept and continue to embrace these truths, no matter what the enemy tries to, to use through deception, um, we will not be deceived, no matter if he brings different scientific endeavors, no matter if he brings biblical scholarship, anything that the enemy uses to undermine the truth of God's word, which is wrapped up in who Jesus is and the light that he shines on our path will be brought to zero and to naught. So as we continue to study Whispering Hope family, I pray that you will find peace, hope and encouragement in the word of God, which is the only safety that we have 
in these last days as the battle rages on. Again, let us choose whom we're going to serve today and let it be Christ and Christ alone because we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. God bless you, gentlemen. May you continue to enjoy the blessings of the Sabbath as you go on your way, as you go to preach, as you go along God's business today. And I pray that you will continue to join us um, every day of this week as we continue to go in detail every day into the study as we look into um, light shines in the darkness. Tomorrow morning, we are going to be looking at the topic um, compromise. All right, we're going to be looking at compromise satan's subtle strategy happy sabbath everyone god bless you continue to like our video share it and subscribe to our channel god bless you gentlemen and i'll see you next week same place same time